Are you okay for us to post this as an instant premiere? Yep. Okay, sure. good. All right. Yes, sir. After this I was thinking that to myself, but now we've got the nice grey skies. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm suggesting just do it. I, I then do that. Let's do that. Okay. At least we've got something. Maybe yes. we get something else later. I mean, at least of everybody here at the end of the yeah. first talk will just get. You know, it's become very fashionable to have grey skies. <laughs> I'm not from Scotland. <laughs> we didn't know there was climate change, you know. <laughs> Okay, let's let's make a move. Um, the uh, the weather has broken, <laughs> which, as you know, is always a sign of changing seasons. In our case, it's the sign of the. Alas, the last day of condensed matter in the city. Uh, we, time to move to warmer climates. Uh, but in the meantime, we've got a very great day for you today. And uh, Pablo is going to kick it off uh, with next generation Moire Quantum Matter. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. It's good to see all of you again. So um, I'm going to tell you, you know, just a very brief introduction to the subject of Moire Quantum Matter. And today I'm going to go into some of the more recent developments that have happened in, in my group. Just a very super brief reminder for those of you that may not have been here yesterday. Okay, we have several platforms to study strongly correlated physics and topological physics, you know, starting from the most traditional one, quantum materials, more, you know, for two decades now, people have been also using neutral cold atoms in optical lattices. And for the past few years, we have an additional platform which is complementary to these two, both in terms of length and energy scales, and also in terms of degree of tunability of the system, okay. which is more quantum matter. With this more quantum matter, we've been able to realize many, many phases of condensed matter physics, and I would say almost you know, all of them, okay? So if you, you're missing. And yesterday I concentrated a little bit on correlated insulators and superconductivity and some recent developments. Today I'm going to talk um, about some of these other phases which we have found. Okay? Now, this is the outline. So I wanna, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell you about next generation more quantum matter, which basically means, you know, going beyond twisted by layer graphene, okay? Between two layers, you know. And in particular, there are two ways in which you can build, you know, more complex, you know, more quantum matter. One is to, for example, um, still work with a single, Twist angle, okay, a single more quantum matter, but you can make more layers. And I mentioned a little bit yesterday, you know, more magic three, four, five point zero. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that at the beginning, and then I will concentrate on more recent stuff where we are playing now with more than one twist angle. You know, I call this dual if you use two, you know, or asymmetric in general more quantum matter. Yeah, and I'll be telling you about the realization of more equals a crystal. You can also superconductivity and strong interactions. And then I hope to have time at the end to tell you about a very unusual, you know, very different type of electricity that we have discovered and a very unusual electric ratchet effect in one of these layer contrasting, you know, asymmetric more heterostructures. So as yesterday, I encourage questions all through, but yesterday I skipped the last part of them on more standard ferroelectricity, although it was also a special type of ferroelectricity which you missed. Today I really want to get to the end. So Ask questions, but you know, give me or, or someone should tell me, you know, when 20 minutes, you know, when I have 20 minutes left, because I, I really want to tell you something about the end. Okay, okay. sounds good. Very good. Um okay, so as a reminder, you know, magic angle twist the valley graphene happens when you twist two graphene sheets on top of each other. The Dirac cones, you know, hybridize because of the interlayer tunneling, and a flat band condition is reached at the magic angle. I explained all of this yesterday. This happens 1.1 degree for graphene on top of graphene. It depends on this interlayer tunnel dowsing. Okay. Now, I don't know, is Ashwin here? No, he's probably uh, skipping today. Okay, but I'm going to make lots of references to him, you know, but 
I, I thought he might be in the audience. This flat one condition, which has flat vans, you know, and in your more structure, you basically, you know, electrons like to localize in certain regions and not in others. And this is going to form sort of an analog of uh, an optical lattice, if you want, you know, in some sense, you know, it has a flavor of it. We can control the density of electrons in our system because we have metallic gates that form a parallel plate capacitor. Yeah, I was going to explain all of that yesterday. And in 2018, you know, we discovered that you can have special types of correlated insulators at an integer, but not four or minus four. Those are trivial. You know, two minus two also happens at three, also happens, you know, some features at one and minus one. I didn't speak about those yesterday, but there's a lot of work now done by the community on the various types of insulating states or semi-metallic states, which are correlated at fractional fillings of those bands, you know, those short bands. And then you can tune away from those insulator states and then you get superconducting those very often. Yeah? Yep. So, so the moment you put your uh, uh, flowing energy anywhere, like even the tiniest occupation of the flat mm -hmm. should you, couldn't you immediately see the so sort of a small gap forming? No, why? Um, just because of uh, strong correlation? Mm, no, I mean, again, the, the analogy doesn't always hold, but you know, cuprates have strong correlations. You have an insulator at zero doping, but not. So I'm just talking about the flat, having a flat band. So what, what is, okay, so then let's say half the length. Yes, so at fractional, at, at various fractional fillings of that band, which are one over an integer, one electron per mole in itself, two, three, you have special things happening, but not that, I mean, actually we also see it at various fractional fraction of fillings at, at, at one third, at five thirds, at, you know, so there are fractional chain isolators, there are charges the wave states, there are all kinds of states which happen also at fractions, but not continuously not everywhere continuously. through. So yeah. a particular fraction and yeah. then half the length. Yeah. So the on. easiest fractions to think of are those that have one, two, three, electrons or holes per more units, and some, something happens, okay. which is equivalent to having integer number of electrons in a and square you lattice, for example. What happens at the fractional things, like one third? And... I'm not gonna talk about that today. Okay. Yeah, and I also didn't just say, that's an entirely different lecture, okay. which I didn't, okay. I don't have time to tell you about. Well, all right, so is that magic angle twisted by layer? I think it has robust mm -hmm. superconductivity. What do I mean by that? First of all, you know, you have a zero resistance mm -hmm. state, okay? you decrease the temperature, Systems drop down, it goes to zero. Okay. Good. Great. Got it. All right. Then we also have flat voltage current characteristics with the sharp switching. So we truly have a dissipationless current, okay? No dissipation of energy. And then you have an abrupt switch, a finite switch instead. Okay. So that the resistance is zero at zero bias, you know, it's actually zero for a while and then it's switching. Again. And then, since in two dimensions you don't have regular Meissner effect, okay, because it's 2D, right, not 3D, what you want to see is just some phase coherence. Yeah? And indeed, if you prepare a just some junction magic angle twisted by graphene, which by the way you do it using electrostatic gates, only using one material, you have to contact different materials, yeah? then you get you know, Fraunhofer oscillations, yeah? which are of a very special type because again, the just some effect in strictly two dimensions is also different. All of these things, you know, I, I got, you know, these are data from my own group, but all of these have been all reproduced, you know, by many groups, yeah, all of these, yeah. So when you have this Joseon effect, in principle, you can have, you know, so you have different superconducting domes, and yep. you could connect different domes. It's them. in that paper. We've Very done all combinations and everything. Look if they were similar, I mean, the same order for me, or does it, do you see some indication that this could be different order? We, you know, we did not study in detail that, but a lot of people have suggested to us to make various geometries, including using angles to define the junctions and so on, to, you know, uh, in, in the spirit of what was done, the Cooper to determine that it was the way. It's a little bit, it's not as easy, okay? Because um, with the gates, we do not define crystallographic, you know, junctions in the in the way that you have with the corners of a you know cuprate and you slap you know as wave superconductors on both sides and so on. So it's not as easy, but you know, Sentil and then a whole bunch of my colleagues asking me like, why don't we do that? Why don't we do that? Okay, and we're exploring the many things to do. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay. Um, I'm going to mention just briefly something about that, but that's an entire new talk on, on, on this. And, and you know, I, I spoke a little bit about that yesterday, but you know, so, yeah, yeah, I know you weren't here yesterday, but um, I'll mention just a little bit about this, okay, in a moment. Um, let me, I'll show you in a, in a slide, I'll mention some about this, okay? Okay, so, so this is a robust superconductor, and I contrast that with signatures of what perhaps is superconductivity, but if it is, it's very fragile in other more acid studies, okay? So there was, you know, experiments done on trilayer graphene aligned to hexagonal organite, twisted bilayer by layer graphene, twisted transition metal dicalcogenides, twisted monolayer graphene on bilayer graphene. All of these, you know, a, a few years after our, you know, the 2018 experiments, they were, you know, people claim that these may be superconductor too, okay? The key signature being that a resistance would transition to a low, sometimes even zero resistance state, okay? However, there were many issues with, with some of these data. The, the nonlinear voltage current characteristics were of this type, not, you know, zero dissipation and sharp switching, you know, a clear signature of a critical current, but rather than smooth nonlinear curve. And there was no report in any of the systems of Joseph's own phase coherence, okay? And also, in general, the reproducibility was extremely limited, okay? Samples always looked a little bit you know, weird and so on, yeah? Yes, so it's, it's very different. You have bilayer graphene with zero twist angle, monolayer graphene here, and you rotate them by an angle, okay? You have strongly correlated phenomena, correlated insulators, interesting magnetism and things. And in some region of the parameter space, it looked like you may have a superconducting transition, okay? You know, there's some characteristics which look like the typical residues in superconductors, but then it turned out not to be, okay? So there was always hesitation here and people arguing and discussing, okay? But in the end, most of the community, most of those papers in the archive version, they said superconductivity in the publishers and they said, nah, Probably not. Okay. <laughs> so we're probably prompted by the referees to show us justice and show us show us the other things that people have seen in magic angle graphene. Okay. So the question for a while was maybe magic angle twisted by graphene is a special, it's one you know, special case, you know, due to the special topology or especially flat bands or who knows what. Okay. And it's the only robust more superconductor. Okay. So now we know that the answer to the question is no. At least there is one more system, mirror symmetric magic angle twisted trilayer graphene. It's a neuro bus model superconductor. Okay, I showed this yesterday, both the group of Philip Kim and myself, we showed <clears throat> that, you know, a couple of years ago, the twisted trilayer graphene at the magic angle is a very robust superconductor. And, you know, last year, we also showed that, you know, four layers at the magic angle, five layers at the magic angle, also robust model superconductor with all the things that, you know, you want to know and you want to check. You know, and this has been reproduced by many groups. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to comment just very briefly about that, okay? Because I, this is two years old, it's a, a year and a half old, so it's all been using quotes in this field, which is all very fast, okay? I will only mention a, a couple of things about that. There is an extensive discussion about all of that in this paper. That's the subject of this paper. What are the Symmetry properties, how are they important? How does it vary the bilayer from the trilayer from the tetralayer? You know, the, the trilayer and the pentalayer have mirror symmetry with respect to the middle. The bilayer and the tetralayer does not. Okay. So we thought we would see an even odd effect. Turns out you see a two-layer effect and then the rest. But it has to do, you know, and it's explained there with the fact that four layers have actually the upper two layers have mirror symmetry, the bottom two layers have mirror symmetry, and there's a cancellation effect there that makes it more similar to the other five. All of that, you know, it's a long discussion. I don't, I don't want to go too much into it, but it's in this paper, very detailed discussion. Yeah. I was wondering whether these um, multi layer systems, which have a higher magic angle, whether they are sort of um, more or less disorder in particular, with respect to twist angle disorder, and whether it's going to be more homogeneous. Yeah. I'm going to address, I mean, I'm going to keep talking about this for a little bit, and I'm going to address some of those points. Yeah. How should I think about multi-layer graphene in terms of hybridization? I'm going to go to that, okay? I mean, 
this intro before actually talking about this <laughs> because I said this yesterday. That's why I just showed it again. All right. So once mirror symmetric magic analysis is a layer thing, okay, this structure, you have a layer of graphene, then you rotate by an angle theta, and then the next layer, the third layer, you rotate back by minus theta. So this means this geometry, which was proposed by Ashwin's group, is called A two step A stacking. Okay. The atoms in the first layer and in the third layer, they're exactly on top of each other aligned and theoretically also exactly on top of each other. And the middle layer is rotated. Yeah. In that sense, there is a single angle theta, which is relevant okay, in terms of more air physics. You know, many groups have worked on this. Actually, by, by now, it's actually hundreds of papers on this. And also all the later twisted trilayer and multilayer systems with varying angles and so on. Okay. How should I think about twisted trilayer graphene? Okay. Turns out, so if you think about you know, these three layers where there is interlayer tunnel T between layer one and two and T between layer two and three, turns out the Hamiltonian of the system, you can do a basis transformation and becomes block diagonal, where one block is magic angle twisted by layer graphene with a renormalized tunneling square root of two times T. And you also have a monolayer graphene sector, okay? So you can think of twisted trilayer as magic angle by layer plus graphene. The square root of two t here means that the magic angle for magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, remember I mentioned yesterday and I reminded you earlier, depends on that interlayer tunnel. Because of this square root of t, the angle, the magic angle for magic angle twisted trilayer graphene is that of by layer times square root of two. Okay? So it's 1.1 times square root of two is 1.56 degrees. Yeah? That means that the more wavelength is a little bit shorter because a larger angle means a little bit smaller more pattern, which means the electrons are a bit closer, they interact a bit more strongly. Okay. Now, if you calculate the electronic structure when in the symmetric condition, okay, also symmetric structure is symmetric, but also electrically symmetric, then you have these flat bands, this with the more remote bands. This is magic angle twisted by the graphene like. And you have an extra Dirac color from the monolayer graphene part. Okay. Now, our devices, as I mentioned yesterday, often have two gates, one at the bottom and one at the top. With these two gates, you know, you form two parallel plate capacitors with a twisted by layer graphene. And you, if you if you put same voltage on these two gates, you vary the density symmetrically without applying an electric field. If you put opposite voltages to these gates, you are applying an electric field while keeping the density fixed. And of course you can do any combination and both, okay? So in general, we can break, you know, structurally symmetric, but we can break electrically the symmetry by applying an electric field and polarizing our wave function. If you do that, you hybridize the monolayer graphene sector with the magic angle bilayer sector, okay? And that the hybridization of these two, okay, can be done continuously. You know, die in and off as a function of the displacement field that you apply. Yeah? So the electronic structure is highly tunable. Yeah? Now, in this system, you get zero resistance, you get flat. Here, the contrast, unfortunately, is very good, but you get no system oscillations. Yeah? It's an electrically tunable superconductor. In addition, this is all tunable by displacement field as well as filling factor. Yeah? Yesterday, I was showing this type of plots whatever as a function of healing factor or density, number of electrons holds per more unit cell. Now we can tune the whole thing with displacement field by polarizing, you know, by hybridizing the electronic structure, et cetera. Okay. You can find all kinds of details about this in this paper, yeah? Please remind us about feeling you get here for relativity. Also, mostly between minus two and minus three, which is the same as magic angle, but we can tune, you know, uh, so this is overall holes, and we can have extra holes, or electron doping with respect to two holes per more unit cell. And the same thing here. And we can analyze where do these appear. There are actually some hope singularities in the system that we can tune. A lot of interesting physics, which is there, okay? Yeah. Now, going back a little bit to your question. Yeah, this is related to your question, okay? Usually the way we compare superconductors in physics, okay, it's not just the absolute value of the critical temperature, which is important, especially for application, but you want to know how strong is the superconductor, how strong is the pairing glue given the density of electrons, the Fermi temperature, various you know, characteristics you can point your system, okay? 
And it turns out that magic angle, and, and you know, so this is something which is usually called, referred to as an Uemura plot, the different versions of Uemura plot. I'm using here, this is a log log scale of critical temperature and Fermi temperature, which is the you know, density either in 2D and 3D because some comparing very superconductors appropriately normalized, okay? In this type of plots, conventional weak coupling BCA superconductors tend to be near this corner. For example, aluminum has a TC of about one Kelvin with a gigantic density of electrons, you know, gigantic Fermi temperature of over 100,000 Kelvin. Yeah? The more you go in this direction, the more exotic your superconductor is. Yeah? And in particular, in this purple band, you have all the superconductors that people suspect are unconventional. Okay? You have the cuprates, you have the nitrites, you have the heavy fermions, you have the organics, et cetera. Yeah? Well, <laughs> magic angle twisted bilayer graphene and magic angle twisted trilayer graphene are here. Yeah? They have the strongest pairing glue that we are aware of of any superconductor. Okay? They have from the temperatures which are many orders of magnitude smaller than aluminum, for example, all the TCs are actually higher than aluminum. Yeah? If, the, if the cuprates have the pairing you know, glue strength that magic angle twisted trilegraphing has, they would be above room temperature superconductors. And we do not understand why, what makes okay, electrons in magic angle graphene pair so strongly, given how extremely dilute the system is. Okay? We're talking about one or two carriers every 10 nanometer square, roughly, right? That's why density is so dilute. Yeah? It's actually even lower than that because there's a phase transition that I didn't speak about that uh, basically you, you take out what, uh, the, the insulator, you know, you start counting from the insulator state. Okay, there's even smaller density of electrons than that. Yep. Apart from cold atoms, right, where it's stronger. Sorry? Apart from cold atoms, where the pairing is stronger. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm talking about right. real materials. I know that in cold atoms, you, you, people have gone through there. So in particular, in twisted trilayer graphene, and this goes for me to your question, the, we have measured the superconductive coherence length, and it happens to be pretty much the same as the interparticle distance, okay? So you're at the BEC to BCS limit. It's all in the paper that I told you earlier, okay? This, uh, all the details about this. Okay. okay, so another thing which happens with magic angle twisted trilayer graphene is that it's not a spin sing it's not a spin singlet superconductor. Okay? You see magic field physics in your yeah, it's also on that paper. Okay, one of these, one of these, yeah. You see, this is all analyzed in the paper. Um, so twisted trilayer graphene is not a spin singlet superconductor. Okay. If you apply an in-plane magnetic field to the system, the system is 2D, okay? You apply an in-plane magnetic field, you can go to magnetic fields way above the power limit and still maintain superconductivity, okay? You can do this continuously. You will violate, you know, the power limit by over a factor of three. This is in a system that doesn't have spin over coupling, et cetera, okay? In fact, not only we can violate the power limit by a lot, we can kill superconductivity and then see it re-entering, okay? You apply a higher magnetic field and superconductivity comes back in. Yeah? Yes, so you told us that Bali and spin were both the degeneracy. So <laughs> if, it's, if it's not spin singlet, then it's symmetric in spin space. Is it symmetric in Bali space? So you know? we do not know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, initially, everybody thought, well, it's not a singlet, it's triplet, but there are more combinations possible. In particular, you know, central things is a linear combination of spin singlet and triplet, which has a particular value. Configuration, okay, and in particular interval configuration, okay. So, but we don't know yet. Okay, thank you. Yep. Indeed, very good. So, an effect that was initially overlooked is the fact that even though it's two D, it has a finite, you know, thickness between the layers, okay, and because of the large. Um, more unit cell, you have a very small group of zones. So you, you apply an implant magnetic field, you have a large momentum boost. You know, the usual material for this dimension, there would be nothing, but actually here, a small momentum boost is a big fraction of the, so you actually, you have a big depairing effect due to orbital implant magnetic field. Mm -hmm. This is all analyzed in this paper. And that's part of the reason, you know, initially we thought, so the, for the bilayer, we don't see a big violation of the power limit because of this in-plane orbital effect is very big. For the trilayer, because it's middle symmetric, the bottom two and the top two layers can, you know, 
effect for labor, but then they kill trans cells actually. And it's, that's why you violate it probably by a lot. We thought that four layers, which is not mirror symmetric, would be like two. But the local three layers and the local bottom three layers do have that symmetry, so you can calculate it, and it mostly cancels, not completely, it mostly cancels. And in five layers, is again zero. You can look at all of these things here. Okay, it's analyzing the dot here. Uh, yep. What is the support? What is the perpendicular uh, HCP for the bilayer and for the trilayer? Tiny. It's uh, uh, well, not tiny. It depends. The trilayer can be about five hundred milli tesla, something like that. Tesla. For the bilayer is maybe 100, 200 milli tesla. Okay, so now what we did with the trial layer, it turns out in this paper, as we and collaborators, so that, that you can do with as many layers as you want. Okay, in fact, there is something called a magic angle hierarchy versus number of layers. Okay? This is all for the alternating twist geometry. Okay, so even for two layers, theory predicts that there's a series of magic angles. This parameter alpha, think of it as one over the magic angle more or less. <laughs> so this is the first magic angle. So at, at about <clears throat> four times, uh, like a quarter of the value, there's supposed to be a second magic angle, okay? And then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No one has seen these. We, know, we don't know if those are robust versus things like atomic relaxation and other things that happen when you go to very small angles, okay? So no one has seen this. The theory says that there are these. And then, you know, for three layers, another series, so you have the, the first magic angle, second magic angle, third, etc. At four layers, this thing splits, and you have the red dot and the blue dot. So you have the first magic angle, the first first magic angle, the first second magic angle, the first third magic angle, and you also have the second first magic angle, the second second magic angle, the second third, and this thing splits, you know, like a breed, and it has branches, you know, and splits to infinity down there, okay? Each of these dots has different electronic structures, different topological structures, etc. Yeah, I'm, I've concentrated on this dot and this dot, and I'm going to tell you about this dot and this. But there are hundreds of dots there to explore. Yeah? Now, the same thing that happens for the trilayer happens for all of these. Okay, you can decompose into a change of basis, and your Hamiltonian becomes block diagonal. Where one block is always a flat band, a magic angle to the ballet of life. Yeah. With that, we normalize Fermi, you know, uh, tunneling, which depends on the number of layers. Yeah. Then you get as many large angle twisted by layer graphene sectors as extra pairs of layers there are. And if you have a total odd number, you get an extra model layer graphene. Okay. So the electronic structures for two, three, four, five, okay, and the magic angles are here. Two layers, you know, just a flat band, three layers, flat band plus data cone, four layers, flat band plus large twisted by layer graphene. Okay, that's not a data cone, that's large angle twisted by layer graphene. Five layers, you get flat band, large twisted by layer graphene plus data cone. Okay, and so forth, and you keep going. Yeah. Steve, um, in this alternating twisting structure, how was your margin of error for each of the other angles of that comparison to the other? Mm -hmm. I'll talk in a moment about experiments. Okay. So if you, you know, so we set out to try to measure this thing, okay? A very patient and persevering graduate students, you know, so, it's, so if you measure, you know, our best magic analysis to biography in terms of, you know, you see is this one, so trilayer is this, tetralayer is this, pentalayer is this, okay? So this is a family of robust uh, superconductors, okay? They all superconduct. In fact, it turns out, the yield gets better the larger the number of layers, surprisingly. You may think that you have more probability of errors, et cetera, but it turns out the phase space, the parameter space in density and displacement field over which superconductivity exists grows with the number of layers for reasons which are not entirely understood. Maybe some of these extra bands help, you know, enlarge the parameter space where superconductivity occurs. This has been observed by several groups, including ourselves. We do not know exactly why. Yep. Is it clear why this is so so similar? So the magic angle, I, 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 yeah, I don't have a, <laughs> you, you may have noticed the magic angle varies, but saturates. Okay? For infinite, it's two point something right? degrees. So the moiré in itself is not like it changes dramatically. And therefore you might expect by, let's imagine that you kept the pairing glue 
of the same strength, okay, along that diagonal ride in the Uemura plot, you would think very different disease, but not because they actually is very similar, you know, all the and then why would it be the same strength? Because it's a matrix element between different orbitals, right? Some different combination of different layers it's doing the twisted bilayer mapping. You might think that would change the interaction. Yeah, so it changes a little bit the critical temperature, but it doesn't change too much and it tends to kind of exaggerate. And you know, we, we weren't surprised because we knew that the Moray pattern actually, you know, the Moray wavelength doesn't change too much. It's all about the, the pattern physics, etc. I wasn't too surprised. I would have loved it if it went, you know much higher, but I would have been surprised if it went much higher, given that, you know, the basic structure is very similar. Just following up on that, you mentioned there was a square root of two. Yeah. It went through, so somehow there's a compensation for the square root of two. Um, you, you, you adjust the angle, and once you adjust the angle, everything compensates. Is that what's going on? Um, okay. <clears throat> the, the true answer is that we do not understand jet superconductivity and its strength in you know, more superconductors. Yeah. So I cannot give you a detailed answer of yeah. why does it exactly compensate. But when you look at the frame temperature, you know, frame temperature, the densities, these are always densities. So a fraction of an <coughs> electron per more unit cell, the more unit cell is changing a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that's changing the frame temperature a little bit. The effective mass changes a little bit because although this flat band is there, it's not identical in all the structures. And the TCs do change a little bit. And somehow, they are doing this in a way that doesn't deviate too much, but but each of those terms doesn't go, you know, doesn't deviate dramatically. Maybe it's okay. another indication it's not a weak coupled system though, because Perhaps. if there were changes in the exponent, the TC would change a lot. Maybe. I don't know. Yep. My eyes don't this so the red term is for my layer, yeah. and the purple is my layer. So yeah. the presence of the dispersive and extra mirror cone does not seem to do too much of a mess. I the or the time and um, no, that's right. So maybe, okay, uh, I'm already seeing that I'm gonna run out of time, but let me tell you an anecdote, which I think it's nice. I was in 2018 at a conference presenting, you know, when we announced my dinner and Rafin, this is a conference on sites or something like that in Italy. And before my talk, this Japanese theorist, Aoki, gave a talk saying, how, you know, what do I think is the best strategy to get very strong coupling superconductivity, very high TC superconductivity? He said, I think that the best combination is to have flat band and a highly dispersive band. And he was trying to make uh, argue that caromeres would be good for this, but of course, but the, but the, the flat band typically is not accessible where you want to be and so on and so forth. And it's a little bit too much head, this thing. Then Ashwin, the following year, publishes Magigram to Sector has a flat band and a dispersive band. And I thought, wouldn't it be funny if it was stronger superconductivity? Well, first of all, we didn't know if it was going to superconduct. You know. But we, you know, because some people argue, oh, maybe the black band, the electrons there screen pins and you know, it doesn't superconduct. But wouldn't it be funny if this combination of flat band and that which we have both accessible with the Fermi energy would give you a very strong superconductor, and then we measured, and it was, okay? I have no idea if it is because of the reasons how we argued or not, but suddenly played a role in my inspiration in, in trying to pursue this thing, which at the time looked like, okay, three layers, exactly on top of each other, etc. you know? So that's... But if it's part of five layers, it's five layers, at least in terms of the they are the same. So I would say that... They're very similar. Well, no, but, no. TC, first of all, it's a little bit higher, not much higher, but a little bit higher. But if you look at the superconducting coherence, okay, it's actually of the same order. It's a much strong, it's a, it's a substantially stronger superconductor than the trilayer than the bilayer. You know, that doesn't mean that TC is higher. Remember, you don't measure the strength of a pairing glue by TC. You have to compare TC yeah. and Fermi, okay? And it is a substantially stronger coupling, couple superconductor. The coherence strength in the bilayer out of order three, four times the interparticle distance, which is also very strong in couple. But for here, it's like one on one. In fact, we can measure all of this as a function of density and the superconductor coherence length and interlayer particle distance follow and track each other and are pretty much the same in the advent of regime. This is all in this paper. <laughs> 10 nanometers, of order 10 nanometers, which is the same as the in the particle distance and the more a in itself, okay? Uh, in both, in both. Uh, in no, in, in the bilayer is for the 40, 50 nanometers, it's a bit larger, yeah? Yeah?
Uh, what happens if you keep twisting in 10 directions? Um, that's called helical twisted multilayer graphene. It's a very interesting system. And I cannot tell more about that yet, but there are interesting theory papers already about it. Mm -hmm. And is there a Fermi liquid theory of the system? And I'll ask the question what's economic pain? Does that make any sense? Um, Sure, you can measure various parameters of this system. You know, we have measured the effective mass, we have measured all kinds of things. And, you know, yeah, I mean, there are hundreds of thousands actually now of theory papers about this. And you can argue, you know, many things. I'm going to continue. Yeah, this is the very first, it was supposed to be the quick thing before I tell you the more recent stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I noticed it's interesting. It's all published. Yeah, there were yeah. hundreds of talks online about this in detail that you can listen to. Yeah, one last question. Yeah, so I'm, I'm showing only a limited temperature range here. Yeah? The bilayer goes strange metal, as I showed yesterday. The trilayer for, you know, in certain regions also does like that. Four and five layers kind of saturates. Difference, the biggest difference is the presence of this last twisted bilayer graphene, extra and extra channels of highly conducting electrons. So your resistance, you expect it to drop in general, okay? However, it's true that it's a much bigger difference between three and four than between two and three. Well, in three, we have already the VF electron drop part, okay? So this is not 100% understood exactly why. All right, let me move on. Let me just say that, you know, for any of you that may have <laughs> all of this, in the version of the archive, the original version, we have this plot. One, two, three, and then, uh, a very anticlimactic five, you know. I mean, two, three, four, and a very anticlimactic five. That samples were at 1.95, which were the prediction of the magic angle by Ashwin in their first version of the paper or, or in the published version of the paper. <laughs> and then one day, Ashwin calls me and says, Pablo, you know what? We included now these relaxation effects, and the magic angle is not 1.95, it's 1.84 degrees. <laughs> Can you make a sample at 1.84? <laughs> Yeah, five players. You know how long it took to make it. <laughs> so, my student Jane, very perseverant, I told her, wouldn't the paper look much better if it happened to superconduct better if it was at the right angle? <laughs> she made devices. Again, I'm not sure if it is because of Ashwin's reasons or, you know, but <laughs> we make a device at 1.84 and it superconducted better. So, yeah. This is uh, how much sample sample relation? Right. These are traces. Remember, we have displacement field, we have density. Yes, so entire so. regions. This is an optimal doping and an optimal displacement field for our best devices. There's a variation of devices depending on two standard. We have many devices for each of these. Okay. So I chose the best of each within the limited sample. Yeah. You know, different, different but devices. of course, no, because you know. With the twist angle, you know, a device with yeah. you're getting out of the twist angle range, the critical temperature is very, very small. Okay, so there's all kinds of variation. Okay, so let me start with the more recent thing. Okay, I'm gonna start with quasi crystals. Okay, so quasi crystal is a solid with long range order but without periodicity. Okay, an example is this plan goes styling, you know, this thin structure, you can sort of get a sense that there is an order, but it actually never repeats itself. But if you take a diffraction pattern, it has discrete dots, which tells you that there's this long range order. Yeah? Another example is twisted by layer graphene. Okay? Here you have a set of dots okay? with carbon atoms and twisted by layer graphene. In general, most, the vast majority of angles are incommensurate. And therefore, this is a, you can see that there is some order here, but it never repeats. It's not periodic. Okay? So, a test criteria for quasi crystal, I mean, if, if you have long range order and it's periodic, it's a periodic crystal. If you have long range order, but not periodicity, this is a quasi crystal. Okay. And a mathematical definition, you know, in my role list is, is if the number of lattice vectors, which is called the rank that you need to define your lattice, is larger than the dimension of the space you live in, then it's a quasi crystal. In the case of twisted by negative, you need four vectors. You live in two or three, or four at least, you account for the high difference. Okay, five, and you live in either two or three dimensions. Either way, you have a quasi crystal. Okay, so now quasi crystals are not very explored. Okay, they're rare. First of all, you you know for theories you don't even have blocks 
you know, which is like the first, the very first thing you need to start doing anything, okay? Now that hasn't stopped, you know, many theories from predicting all kinds of exotic phenomena, you know, topology, physical activity, et cetera, intronics effects in quasi crystals, yeah? Now, with one of those materials, we have this platform where we can do, you know, many things and engineer superlattices in various ways, okay? Twisted bilayer thin at a 30 degree angle happens to be a dodecagonal quasi crystal, okay? Not just that the rank is larger than, but actually a dodecagonal, you know, so. And this was demonstrated nicely by this Korean collaboration. However, the electrons, in the transport experiment or anything like that, they have no idea that this is a dodecagonal quasi crystal because all of the effects occur at super high energy. So you measure this thing and you would not know that this is a quasi crystal. There's no manifestation whatsoever. In fact, these two layers are pretty much decoupled completely at accessible, experimentally accessible, you know, energy ranges in, in, in transport experiments. Okay, you can look at it with a TEM and you see that it's a quasi crystal, but that's it. You can go to much smaller angles where then the hybridization of the Dirac cones occurs of low energies and all the things of flat bands, et cetera, appear. But then also the electrons have no idea that this is a quasi crystal because what the electrons see, okay, this is twisted by at, you know, the, Sort of magic angle, which is 10 nanometers still here between these uh, sites. The atomic structure, atomically, is rank for quasi crystal, but what the electrons see, okay, you have those more bands. In fact, you know, none of you were surprised that I could plot that band structure, you know, continuous and so on, even though there's no block theory or anything like that, right? And that's because the electrons at low energies, what they see is a periodic more crystal, okay? They don't notice that this is actually quasi crystal. Now, since electrons see a periodic crystal, we cannot see the quasi crystal in the field. But maybe we can do the following thing. We can take another twisted bilayer thing with a different twist angle. It's also an atomic quasi crystal, but it's a periodic crystal for the electrons. But these two have now different more periods. So if I put them together, particularly rather than having two separate bilayers, I make a tri-layer, but with different angle between one and two and two and three, I do this. I create a moire quasi-crystal, where the quasi-crystallinity is in the moire structure, not in the atomic structure, okay? So this would be a rank for moire quasi-crystal made of two, you know, made of a, a rank six atomic quasi-crystal, okay? Because of the different periods. Okay, so you use, rather than the atoms, the moire unit cells as the building blocks, you can engineer these in various ways because you can choose these two angles, and I'll show you a little bit of that. You have now more density scale, which is of the order of 10 to the 12, so you have access to the full range of densities and energies, which may be, you know, you may be interested in. It's tunable using electrostatic gates and then, you know, tunable interaction, etc. So how do we do this? We just put, you know, make twisted trilayer graphene, but rather than the symmetric structure that I told you before, we choose different twist angles, okay? If you measure the resistance, this is the log scale versus displacement field and density. I don't know if you noticed, but in the magic angle twisted trilayer graphene case, it was up and down symmetric, okay? Now it's not symmetric up and down because the twist angles are different, okay? However, we can still extract the twist angles by doing the following trick. Right. You can take a cat here and you can see some peaks. You take cats at different energies, you see different peaks, and they occur in different regions, okay? So how do we extract the actual twist angles? What we do is the following. We choose a displacement field and a density such that we're exploring, you know, the band insulator that would happen if, you know, you had only the bottom by layer, okay? And we tune the top layer to the charge neutrality point, and then we see an enhanced resistance peak. It's not infinite, it's not an insulator because the top layer still conducts at the charge neutrality, but it's a distinct high resistance feature which occurs at a given density. And that tells us that this, you know, the layers one and two have a 1.4 degree twist angle. You do the same thing here, okay? These other resistive states, of course, when we polarize with displacement field density such that we do the opposite for the top two layers. And that tells us that this is 1.9 degrees, and we know it's minus because we fabricated them like this, okay? In an alternating twist, but with non-symmetric angles, okay? 
But now we know what are our twist angles. They are different and therefore this is going to form a more quasi crystal. You don't want them too different because remember, you know, you want those two periods to be kind of similar to make the quasi crystal. So, yeah. Probably in the fabrication process, you would know the angle more or less, right? Yes. So this was close to what, yeah. Okay. So if you now take, apply and you know, measure this resistivity data in a magnetic field, I'm sorry that the contrast is not very good here, but I'm going to zoom in. Then you see, you know, so first of all, so you have these three, you know, reciprocal spaces for each of the layers, and then you can join, you know, pairwise to make, you know, uh, unit cells of each bilayer, okay? Bilon cells of each bilayer, you know, you have the three data comes from the three layers and they are each renormalized, okay? Because of the coupling to the neighboring layers and in different ways, depending on the you know, twist angle, rather right? twist angle between subsequent layers, yeah? So if you zoom in here, you see okay. actually lots of lambda levels and if the contrast was better, you would see even more, you know, which are even then crossing, okay? You can look at this paper, which is about to come out or look at the archive. We can, um, <laughs> Yeah, so we have three sets of lambda levels, you know, and yeah, I'm sorry, the, the, the lines don't come up very good here, but basically by looking at the lambda level crossings here and looking at them as a function of displacement here and density, we can get, you know, uh, in a calculation, you know, a pattern that matches those and you can extract what is the ratio of the renormalized frame velocity. You cannot get all three, but you can get the ratios, you know, V1 over V2 and V2 over V3, okay? And you can see that they are different. Okay, so these diracons are hybridized, but they still retain some layer character. It's not like the magic angle where it's completely hybridized, okay, in the flat line. Now, you can calculate something called the spectral function. You cannot calculate, you know, the band structure, because this is a quasi result. You can calculate something called the spectral function, which means in energy and in momentum along the direction K3, K1, K2, for example, okay, so here, you can calculate what states are there what energy and how many of them are there, okay? So this triangle here gives you the color scale, you know, the, the, the color of these things tells you whether they're mostly on layer one, mostly on layer two, layer three or in between, okay? And the thickness tells you whether there are many or a few, okay? So you can see that near the child neutrality, we have three layer polarized Dirac cones, you know, approximately periodic, okay? structure. It looks like an approaching periodic structure. But then at higher Fermi energy, you have these spaghetti of flat bands. There is where the quasi-crystallinity is being seen by the electrons, okay? And then at higher energy, you have still this fast band from one of the layers, which is, has a larger angle, and it sort of maintains more of its layer character than the bladders, okay? So if you look at, you know, if, you know, this region is going to look for the electrons, it's going to look periodic like. This region is going to look quasi periodic like, you know, quasi crystalline. So if you look near charge neutrality, where you have these three sets of semiconductor has oscillations clearly resolved, that's because the electrons there think they are in a periodic like with three cones, you know, with renormalized frame velocities. When you go outside that region, the silicon has oscillations disappear because you're in the spaghetti flat bands now, okay? Except one which can be still seen a little bit, which is a fast band, which maintains still a little bit of its periodicity like character. Periodic like character, okay? You can calculate the density of states for this system, okay? And it turns out you can also look, you know, do a whole density measurement, which I, although I haven't discussed about this in magic angle binary trilogy, lots of experiments have shown that at these integers, you have in the whole density a change, you know, we call them resets. They have various names, which are actually phase transitions to the constructions of the Fermi surface. Turns out this also happens here, okay? Rather than going this straight line, if you see a particle, it has this reset, okay? Which tells you that the interactions are happening and doing something. And on both sides of that reset of that phase transition, we have superconductivity, we have superconducting dots, okay? With, you know, coherence lengths. It's not as strongly coupled, you know, as the bilayer or the trilayer, okay? In the, in the trilayer, you know, the, the ratio of the interparticle distance and coherence length is about one, okay? Here is about a factor of 10, but still relatively strongly coupled, okay? 
the you know typical VCS systems is a factor of ten thousand or a thousand. Yeah. In number forty two metal, there's some reports on localization. So we we don't see we see highly resistive states, but not insulating states. Okay. Um, and we think it's because some of those data cones, you know, they're like highway for electrons, okay? So they're short circuiting, you know, your system. Similar as magic and the trilayer of thing. The trilayer doesn't have insulated states, the tetra layer, the penta layer. They have features which are the insulated states of the bilayer sector, but then you have a highway of electrons short circuiting you, and that why it's not insulated. I think there was a hand raised <coughs> somewhere. No? Okay. So I understand. It could be, and we don't know. Okay, it could be. Now, I should mention that, of course. You know, from any finite side quasi crystal, you can make a periodic crystal. You just repeat that, right? <laughs> you make it periodic then. So, you know, if I have a um, hundred square meters of this quasi crystal, and then I repeat it and I made it 10 kilometers square, huh? okay? I guarantee you that if I measure locally in my micron device, I don't see absolutely any difference. So, you know, there's, there's something to be said for, you know, any. Commensurate structure, you know, any incommensurate structure is right next to another commensurate, commensurate one sufficiently large. And obviously, the physics cannot change dramatically if you're deviating, you know, 10 to the minus 23 from one to the other. So, you know, there's something to be said about that. Yeah. yeah. Now, this is, you know, you have theta one, two, and theta two, three. Okay. Magic and the twisted bilayer, obviously, it's a dot on, on this line, also twisted monobi. The trilayer. Magic and twisted trilayer has one angle positive and one negative because of this alternative twist. You have the entire phase space here. This axis, the bottom part is for alternating. This one is for chiral or helical that someone asked. Okay. You can think of where am I going to find in this phase space quasi crystals? Where am I going to find mostly periodic like looking things and so on? Okay. So you, you can do study of something in you know, this parameter gamma would tell you what is the minimum of. So, you know, relevant length scales, which are include the atomic scale and the more wavelengths of layers one, two, two, three, and three, and, and one, three. Okay. So, if you look at that parameter for magic angle twisted by the graphene, okay, the relevant ratio there is the more wavelength over the atomic scale wavelength, I mean, over the atomic scale, and that's much, much, you know, that's a four that are 100. When that happens, when gamma is very large, you expect to see a periodic more crystal. Separation of scales is very large. You know, the electrons don't notice they live in a quasi crystal. In the example that I just told you, 1.4 minus 1.9, you have here all relevant length scales, and the parameter gamma is of order one. When gamma is small, over the one or, or, or two, or something like that, then you expect to see more a quasi crystal in here. Okay? So you can plot gamma here, okay, and purple, this is in log scale, purple is quasi periodic, crystal, small, you know, and then blue is others. I mean, and then yellow is periodic. You can see that mm, for most combinations, you actually expect to see this type of quasi crystallinity. Yeah? In fact, in this uh, parameter space, you can plot that spectral function at various points, like there, there, in C, you know, both for the chiral or the or the head, you know, or the alternating twist. You know, the all of these electronic structures have, you know, I mean, all of these are different spectral functions, different topological properties, and so on and so forth. Okay, so it's it's quite a bit of phase space. We're beginning to look at some of this, and you know there will be interesting stuff coming in the next ones for some of these. Yeah. Okay. Are you aware of any limits to achieving um, arbitrary seeing uh, that an ample rotation symmetry in the near quasi crystal, like for example, we think about a five fold symmetry in quasi crystal seven fold symmetry? Mm -hmm. but yeah. As a, a it, 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 it feel like you can. So the, the answer is, I don't know. I know that twisted valley graphene at 30 degrees is a dodecagonal quasi crystal. Most of the stuff that I told you, they are not forbidden symmetry type of quasi crystals, you know, five fold or something like that. They are, you know, you know, you know there, there is a debate in the quasi crystal community whether quasi crystal should be used purely for those forbidden symmetries or it should be a more general. You know, 
this rank greater than the dimension of the space you live in, which is much more general. Okay. These are, for the most part, that I've been describing are just incommensurate, you know, to the existence that you put on top of each other. Okay. But they're manifestations of that incommensurability. Okay. But it is true that given that we can play with all the angles of all the layers, etc., you can I can imagine that you can engineer various types of you know, symmetries which might be, you know, like at 30 degrees to the canal, maybe there are a combination of angles that you can make a different type of providence symmetry. I, I don't know. Uh, same angle in the same direction. Okay. Sometimes we call it chiral, sometimes helical. I think helical probably is better, but, you know, we adopted helical more recently. <laughs> this was what was symmetry. Okay. Last question before I move on to the last part, which I still, I still have at least 20 minutes, right? Because you still have Okay, good. So, since you're computing superconductivity, you, uh, you compared the uh, coherence length to semi wave vector, but uh, how about the uh, mean free path? What would you consider it here or to? Yeah, mean free path in this structure are typically longer than any of those. Yes, it's a highly crystal. Your graphene is super. We don't have chemical impurities, we don't have anything like that. So, mean free path can vary between order 20, 30, 50, 100 nanometers and microns, depending on the quality of the device. So typically much longer. Okay, so let me tell you now about this. Okay, and it's quite a change of of, of subject, sort of. So you know, depending on what type of system you have, your electrons can display you know a variety of behaviors in condensed matter physics. And one way of thinking about them is like you know the behaviors which are associated with dependent on electrons, like superconductivity, conduction in edge states, and so on. Behaviors which are more like, you know, one thinks of localized electrons, you know, like you know, you know, moments on site energy is having more and so on, electron structure like this. And then you have also behaviors, you know, which seem to appear when you have both localized and itinerant electrons together, like, you know, heavy fermions and color physics, you know, commercial superconductivity when you dope a motor insulator, et cetera. Okay. Now, in more again, with an engineer study and control of these things, highly tunable. So, for example, superconductivity and topology has been seen, iterant you know, type of behavior. Modern generalized unit crystals and other things have been seen, in particular in twisted transition metallic calculated structures, which you know is more like localized type of systems. And there has been also substantial evidence now building for both presence of itinerant and localized electrons in magic angle twisted by graphene related system. Okay. Started with two papers by our group and also by the group of Andrea Young, then also uh, Ali Jazani on this, you know, tropic evidence for formal and shoot effect, which was in collaboration with Weissman. Um, and the Bernabeck and others have proposed these models of topological heavy heavy fermion physics to describe magic angle twisted by graphene, you know, highlighting that character of localized flat bands and itinerant highly dispersive bands. In trilateral graphene, we have it right there, you know, those two types of characters of electrons. And in transition metal dicarbonate, pathogenites, recently, you know, people have spoken about this gate in a more echo the lattice, again, pointing out to this, you know, character of both localized and pyridine systems. So I'm going to show you a relatively novel Moray system, although some of you may think like, oh, wait, this has been studied a lot, but not in a particular configuration I'm going to describe. And where we have coexistence of localized and itinerant electrons and an unexpected coupling between these localized and itinerant electrons. Okay? In particular, we see a very interesting Moray electron ratchet effect uh, I'll describe in a moment. So the system is layer contrasted or asymmetric Bernal by layer graphene on HBM Moray heterostructure. What do I mean by that? So I take Bernal by layer graphene, no twist angle between the two layers, okay? zero twist angle in AB configuration, the usual Bernal stuff here. And it's sandwiched between two VN layers. It also has bottom and top metallic gate. Okay. So I can kind of apply a displacement field. You can vary the displacement field and the density of electrons independently. And one of the layers is aligned to hexagonal boronitride substrate. So now the hexagonal boronitride, hexagonal boronitride, the HVN substrate plays a critical role. Okay. It so happens by you know, magic that. The Moray pattern or graphene aligned to HVN, given the 1.8% lattice constant difference, is 13 nanometers, the same as that of magic and graphene. Okay, this happens. Okay, I'm not sure if it's any wrong, but it happens. So that's why you see 13 nanometers. This is not twistable graphene. Graphene aligned to HVN. Okay, 
So, <laughs> yep. Can I just check, are those BM blocks monolites or are they? They're, no, no, these BM blocks are thick. Yeah. Okay. We can bury the thickest. But, okay, yeah. So, the important thing is that one of them is aligned to the graphene, the other one is misaligned to the graphene. Okay, that's why it's an asymmetric water pattern. Now, let me tell you if you have bilayer graphene, regular bilayer graphene without any alignment to the BM, okay, and you measure transport versus top gate and back gate okay, resistance, okay, <laughs> this is what you see. You see a diagonal line, okay, this is showing the charge neutrality point, so the high resistance point. This high resistance point is not very high here, and as you apply a displacement field, okay, before I've shown you data on displacement field density, when this is rotated and there's a, would be a vertical line. Here I'm just showing raw data, okay? The top gate and the back gate, you know, they apply, you know, if they're both at zero, zero, you're at charge neutrality. If you apply them with opposite uh, voltage, you keep charge neutrality, but you're applying a displacement field. That breaks the symmetry between the two layers of graphene and opens a band gap in the electronic structure and the resistance increases exponentially, okay? And the same thing in the other direction. Okay? If I go, along this perpendicular direction, I'm changing the density at a fixed electric field. In this direction, I'm changing the electric field at a fixed density. In particular, for this color bank, this color line is just charge neutrality. This is, this has been measured by, I, I forgot the reference here, it was predicted first in theory and then measured shortly after by the Morpurgo group experimentally 20, uh, no, 12 years ago or so, and has been seen by hundreds of groups, okay? This is what you always see. If you have, oh, sorry, yes, actually, I have a reference. If you have bilayer graphene in this layer contrasting moiré structure, this is what you measure, okay? You have the resistance versus top gate and back gate. In some areas where it looks sort of like this, but then you have this area, for example, here in the middle where this line is vertical, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm measuring the resistance versus back gate as I change my top gate and nothing happens in this middle region even though my top gate is adding carriers to the system, but nothing happens, okay? So initially we call this the gate not working behavior, you know, <laughs> because it seems like the top gate is not working. We even thought maybe it's disconnected or something, you know, but then, okay. Now we chose a more sophisticated name, layer specific anomalous screening, you know, it sounds cooler than gate not working behavior. So, you know, we thought maybe this is an artifact. Why did it happen? This type of systems has been studied to death. Even this has been studied quite a bit. But then, you know, you can see it in many devices. Now you can actually, now that we understand it better, we can engineer it so that we see it, et cetera, right? So this behavior, you know, different devices, it's very robust, okay? So, and again, the key is to have these two different angles, one very close to zero, the other one, Pretty large. Think of 15 degrees, 30 degrees. Yeah. So you have, you know, that the two layers of bilayer graphene, and for the purpose of this data, is that the, the top one is the one that is aligned, you know, with near zero or zero degrees. The bottom one is actually 15 degrees for the specific device. So you have a long wavelength more pattern on the top layer and a very short wavelength because of the large Swiss angle on the bottom layer more pattern. Yeah. We're not even sure. It plays a critical role in the sense of, but it might actually in the specific angle, even though it's large. Okay? So this system, okay, the way we understand it now, and I'm going to show some about it, is that in region there it has different regimes of behavior. Two and four look more or less normal superficially in this resistance plot. I'm going to show you now that they're actually the most normal, but they are extremely non-normal. But here, superficially, they look like they do what you expected. They have a slope here, which, have, which gives you a capacitance ratio between the bottom gate, the top gate, you know, and what influences the charge density, the, the slope of that line, as it usually does in my layer field. And they have regimes one, three, and five, the most dramatic being three, which deviate from that slope and where anomalous screening is happening. Okay. This system because of the presence of that asymmetric more potential has two types of carriers, okay? A localized type of carriers, which you can think of them as you know, sitting in copper bands, okay? And you need to fill, 
And then an itinerant, which you can think of the, the bottom side, so to speak, of the system, which is itinerant that has a bilayer of thing like dispersion, okay? And it's a highly mobile. In a transport experiment, of course, we only see the mobile carriers, the itinerant ones, okay? Because, you know, they have high conductance and they dominate the transport, okay? The localized ones, they either move very little or not move at all, okay? If we do a whole measurement, which is what I'm going to show you in a moment now, we also are only sensitive to the itinerant electrons because the whole density measurement tells you what is the density of itinerant carriers that are moving in your system, okay? And as I mentioned, there was already, you know, this idea that we may have two types of electrons, you know, localized and itinerant, it's not completely new and crazy. There's plenty of evidence from other things where they thought that this might be happening. To us. But this is going to be, I'm going to show you now a more dramatic manifestation of this. Yeah. Uh, question about localization. So is this the binarizable band or is there one here? So for bilayer graphene, I wish Ashwin was here, for bilayer graphene line to HBN, if I remember correctly, that has a different topological structure than the twisted bilayer graphene. Okay. So perhaps it's binarizable. I don't remember right now. Okay, so how can we, you know, what is happening in that region three, okay? What's happening is that over this range, you know, between these two corners, over that range of top gate voltage, what we're doing is we're adding charge to the system. It's not that the gate is not working. We're adding charge to the system, but it's all going into the localized system. And that's why transport looks identical as a value of the top gate in that range, because the thing in the system is the same. We're just adding charge to the localized system, okay? How much charge? So you can measure the whole density as a function of gate-induced density, okay? This is a cut along that line, okay? You can see that in these regions, two and four, we're adding charge to the system as expected. In region three, the whole density remains fixed, okay? Which is consistent with this not changing, okay? So you can, you know if you trust that the electrostatics works and your gates are inducing, you know, the gate inducing charge that we know they should be inducing, then you can just subtract with your measuring minus the total gate induced charge and you get the localized carrier density, okay? And in regions two and four, it's flat because there it's working like it should. And in regions three, five, and one, it's changing because it's the localized system that we're charging, yep. Do you get the same result if you ramp up the voltage versus going down? Yes, but in a way, I'm going to show you now the relative behavior. The hysteresis is in all kinds of things. Okay, so I'll show you in a moment. If you slightly misalign <laughs> from the substrate, is it still continuously? We haven't done the let's. Uh, we haven't done this slightly misaligned continuously. Uh, that would be an interesting experiment. We haven't done it. Okay, so. The way you know you have to think about going through these regions, one, two, three, four, five, okay, is in the regions where we have this layer normal screening, we're filling a Haber body, okay? And then there is a range of normality in between fillings of those Haber bands. Now let me show you the most dramatic manifestation or, or the most dramatic thing that happens in this system. Okay. Let's sit at this corner between three and four, okay? So when we just fill one of these here, when you just fill this middle half of eye, okay? That resulted in the anomalous screening behavior here, right? Because so we're sitting at that corner, happens at six volts of top gate, okay? So I just fill that half of eye, the localized bands, and I'm here, okay? I just, I, you know, I, I just fill it, I have a, uh, that finite density uh, at six volts of top gate. And I'm going to increase my top gate voltage following this pattern. I'm going up and down and up and down. But I'm going to increase the top gate voltage because I'm going along this line and I'm increasing the top gate voltage. I'm adding carriers to the system, okay? And this is what my whole density tells me. I'm adding carriers to the system. Now I stop at eight volts, okay? So, so I do this and I stop there. And now I decide, let me undo the top gate voltage. Let me, you know, I would have thought I'm going to subtract those carriers that I just added. But if I just decrease the top gate voltage, my whole density remains fixed. I'm not undoing what I just did. The whole density remains fixed. 
Okay, so you're like, mm, wait a moment, that's odd. Okay, let's ramp up again, little gate voltage. I get to eight and then it does this thing. It remembers where it, you know, I stopped before and now it increases. I stop. I'm like, wait, wait a moment. Okay, let's undo again. But if I undo, my whole density remains fixed. And then I do this again, and I can do this again, okay? If I go to minus six, that would be this corner down here instead of this corner up here. And I do the same thing. It holds the exact same thing happens, okay? And I'm down there, okay? There is a ratchet effect where I'm able to send, you know, electrons between the Ethereum system. I'm, I'm able to, sorry, I'm able to send electrons to the Ethereum system, the gate charge the Ethereum system, but then I'm not able to take them out. And the same thing with the holes. I'm able to throw holes into the Ethereum system, but I'm not able to take them out. Okay. So this is a ratchet dynamic, it's unidirectional, goes in one direction without the other, okay? You all probably know what the ratchet is. So what happens at that six volts is that I have completely filled the localized system with electrons, okay? Now, I add epsilon voltage, okay? I increase my voltage a little bit more. I cannot add another electron to the localized system because that band is filled. What I do is I add it to the Ethereum system. But still the gate which is inducing all of this is this top gate. When I now remove the voltage, rather than taking out this guy, what I actually do is I take out one of these and I leave the Ethereum system there. And that's why the whole density remains fixed, yeah? So it's like if you pause at some point during that protocol, does it eventually progress? Not for as long as we have waited, but we haven't waited years, not months, <laughs> okay? okay. No, 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 it doesn't. No, let me, keep, let me continue, okay? So, and the same thing happens with holes, okay? In fact, if I now, you know, I not only remove one hole, but I, I keep removing electrons, I keep now decreasing my voltage, what happens is that I, have a remnant charge separation, okay? So if I keep decreasing the voltage, eventually, okay, I end up with an electron and a hole in the electron system, or if I do it on the other side of the diagram, I remain with a hole and an electron. And these are you know, dipolar you know, excitons, which are in the system, which are oriented in the vertical direction because of the asymmetry in the moral potential, okay? This happens at charge neutrality and in the ground state. Okay? Yeah. So where, where are the localized electrons actually living? In, in, in the top more interface, in the bilayer graphene at the top more interface, which is the one that has a long wavelength. So, so should, should I think about the itinerary point? Just As in the bottom the interface, kind of. In reality, when you, you know, Caxias has done electron structure calculations at a single particle level of all of this, and it's a fraction of the electron, it's not 100%. You know, one and the other, okay? Is that, but you have a localization of the order of 20% of your wave function, you know, on the top interface, while the bottom is uniform distribution. Uh, I mean, the amplitude oscillation of the wave function on the moral scale. This is all in the archive paper. So I can do this when I go to, let's say, six volts. But if I go further in displacement field, actually, I can end up with two or with three or with any number of separated electron hole pairs in the system, okay? In fact, you know, so this is what's described here. You know, I can increase my voltage, you know, at six volts, I filled all of them. I add a one, now I subtract, so I remove one of these. And then if I take the voltage down, I keep taking it down to zero, I end up with this. I can now, you know, from zero, go to minus six volts plus delta, and I am in this situation, which is similar to this one. And now I start removing them, and then I end up like this. And then I can go back and forth between this, or I can do this going further in gate voltage so that I end up with a configuration where you have two electrons in the Ethereum system, which lead ultimately 
So this true electrophotons here, and I can do it like this, yeah? In fact, I can end up with any number of the color excitons that I want, okay? Just one second. If I measure the whole density in my system, the displacement field at total charge neutrality, I have, depending on the displacement field range that I went to, I have an ever increasing hysteresis loop, okay? I have electricity where the electric dipole moment of the system can be continuously tuned because the basic unit that is contributing to the ferro electricity is a continuous distribution or continuous integer distribution of excitons in the system that I can vary at will. Rather than having as in a regular ferroelectric, the entire structure which does and the whole electric dipole changes, here I can add one, two, three, four excitons and then the dipole moment increases, 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 increases okay? So these states have different number of excitons in the system responsible for the electricity. So an electronic for electricity, not a structural for electricity. Lydia, you had a question? Yes. So um, is it they're saying they're you're not able to take electrons out of the signal and it is itinerary band because of the, the, the exciton and uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, so I have my localized band full. The top rate is the one that sees first that interface. It, it wants to fill that interface. You know, it's a parallel plate capacitor. It sees a plate here. It wants to put charge there. But it can't now because it costs me charging energy because I've completely filled the band. So, okay, the next best option is charge the next, the other interface, so to speak, a, a further away layer. But now, if I want to remove charge, the first interface I see is this one. So, so I grab it from here. Okay? It's, it's not as simple as that because you may wonder, well, wait a moment. If you just did this, you should undo this. But no, the moment I add this other carrier, okay, to the system, there is an exit information process, which is a many body state. To get the ferro electricity, to get the hysteresis, there must be some rigidity in the system. Okay? To not just simply undo what you just did, the system has to change in between when you added that. And that is the formation of the Ferroelectric, okay. The next one, yeah. Is there no excitons emitting the We don't know. We don't have any signatures of asymmetry or anything. When we're measuring these maps of resistance, the curves continue to be clean and everything. We don't have an obvious signal that the system is phase separating into microscopic domain, <laughs> okay? But you know, we don't know. Sure. Let, let me just one second say one thing and then I can get more questions. Yeah. Okay, so you can measure the remnant um, whole density, you know, the whole density when you go back to zero displacement field. When you go back to, just remember, I, you know, in this hysteresis loop, okay, here when I'm in small displacement fields, I'm just going back to zero. But the moment I start inducing this exciton, the remnant charge when I go back to zero displacement field and zero density varies, okay, depending on, you know, how many excitons I have put there, okay? And you can measure and then it saturates, okay? So one thing that is important is, you know, people tell me like, wait, wait a moment. You have already broken immersion symmetry because you had the central standards at the top and at the bottom interface, okay? Yes, but that's a breaking symmetry field which does not do much other than aligning the excitons in the vertical direction, okay? Because in a regular ferroelectric, okay, you go to inversion symmetry breaking, but the two ferroelectric states have the opposite polar axis, the opposite inversion symmetry breaking. But I can go between this state with the electric double moment up and this state with the electric double moment down, but the angles don't rotate and it becomes the flip structure, okay? The angle remains the same, okay? So that's just a weak symmetry breaking field, which is not the responsible symmetry breaking for the ferroelectric action up and down, okay? So, these are not equivalent flip lattice configurations, okay? The lattice remains the same, and I flip the entire dipole moment. Um, <clears throat> because I can do this continuously with this number of excitons, I have now a memory, a ferroelectric memory, where I have continuously programmable memory states, okay? In fact, we can do you know, standard switching of these things. By the way, all of this works at room temperature, okay? One of the few things in my life that I've done that works at room temperature. So it can have an ultra dense memory, you know, where you can vary continuously, you know, you can do up to 500 states at least, you know, that's in the system. And I'm, I'm not showing this because my collaborators don't want me to show it, but 
this has certain neuromorphic computing properties which are extremely advantageous with respect to regular feral FTs. System can learn much better than other systems because of the continuously tunable feral FT properties. Yeah. Is there a way of measuring the cycle name? So because I'm learning to measure the displacement, yeah. but you can't use that for a so, so we have estimated the dipole moment in a, in a previous paper, but this but maybe we included it in the supplementary of this one also, you know, because people ask us in a previous paper where we measure some signatures already of this uh, conventional for electricity, we estimated that. And I don't have the number of the folks my head, but it was in one of the other. Well, but you okay, but you, 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 you know, well, there are many ways of estimating it. You can put a what it's called a graphene sensor on top. So you have your structure, you can put an additional graphene layer. Which you just use to measure what is the polarization that it sees from underneath, okay? And what charge density increase. So you have a graphene ferroelectric field effect on the geometry where the ferroelectric now is this other thing, okay? For example. You're coming up towards the time. I know. It says the last slide. Okay. This trick, you can do it not just with bilayer graphene, but you can take now magic angle bilayer graphene. Have one layer aligned to HVN and the other layer and misaligned to HVN, and you can make a ferroelectric superconductor. Okay, a superconductor that switches in a bistable manner between superconducting and resistive states. Okay, and also the correlating solid states switch in a bistable bilayer manner. And you do this by doing this trick. Okay, this was actually published uh, a few weeks ago, last year, I don't remember, a few months ago. Okay, so with that, I want to end again. You know. Uh, many collaborators and agencies and everything. Oh, good. Thank you very much. Um, you mean, uh, sure, we can flip. I mean, I showed a little bit. Yeah, they get voltage. You know, the voltage they were right here are pulsed, and then we're gonna of course do it continuously. Yes, or, or apply pulses of different lengths, etc. Chair, yeah. you choose who's. Right. Yes. Beautiful talk. Thank you for your most exciting part. Uh, Sweetie question. Uh, so you have the localizing light system, and that uh, that you're trying to get the electron and the power. Yeah. And. Uh, Let's rule for which one works in the different work function. Right? Um, and, and, and the question yeah. is uh, what? Because is that idea in the craft? If that's the no, I, I wouldn't think of it. I mean, it's not the work function. I mean, so the work function basically means how how much energy you have to sit in and out to. to well, chemical, yeah, I, I, I guess you can think of it this way. We don't usually use that word for this particular question. Why yeah. you have this? Yeah, so that that's that's the key thing that I was that I mentioned before, right? Why don't do don't I just undo what I just did, yeah. right? Okay. Well, that is, when I that when I do this, when right. I add an electron, yeah, there is a formation of an exciton, yeah. and many of the other things it changes, and yeah. therefore you are not you know back to a symmetric configuration. There's some rigidity added to the system, yeah. which probably has to do. We don't have a microscopic picture about this. Probably has to do with a many body state. In the system that adds that rigidity, you know, it's like you go to a phase transition. And now you just you, you don't just take epsilon away and do and do what it did because there has been a big transformation in between. It doesn't matter when you do it. still you stick with one particular parameter, whether that's this, this work function or you know, for whatever. That number is going to stay there and then mm. variable in a Z. No, not not really. I mean, I mean. Yeah, think of a regular phase transition. If you have a lock of ice, yeah, and you melt it, yeah. it's not like you cool down a little bit and instantaneously freezes. Oh, there is a you know, yeah, it's, more so more, it's more complicated than that. But I'm just saying as an example of you don't just simply undo what you do a little bit. Second question is about your reactive or or type of you, you look like that from the that one on the in the hydrogen band is a low state. It's, it's completely delocalized. Okay. No, well, it's it's sort of bound, you know, Coulomb bound it's, it's, to the localized electron. And therefore, the electron has and the positive is not the exact same as how it's kind of mirror, mirror each other. This. Um, the, you, have a, you, you have a charge current which is localized, yeah. the other charge is bound to it. You know, with the, uh, that is the right? 
Yes, and that is, well, it doesn't make it in advance, but it remains bound to it, you know, mm -hmm. because it's forming this excitons, okay? That creates a polarization in your system that gives you a whole density in the system, okay? That polarization. Any more questions? Yeah. Pablo, the, this last part of the relativity uh, uh, state, this is some sort of collective state, right? And mm -hmm. Now, it was at room temperature. So, yep. all the others are working below the Kelvin. So, can you comment on why it's so much more robust? Yeah. So, we don't know for sure. My colleague, Liam Fu, they estimated what is the binding energy of those excitons uh -huh. in this configuration, and it's a order 100 millivolts, which is well above room temperature. Okay? Okay. It doesn't work at room temperature in all of the devices. We have many devices, but we have quite a few that have worked all the way to room temperature. And we don't know exactly what that means. What? Um, let me point out you know, in the paper, this is well cited and so on, but this idea of an electronic ferroelectric is not completely out of the blue. The first paper we know of is a paper by Lusham in 1996. Yes. That said that if you have a system which has D and F electrons, 3D and F electrons, where one of the electrons, one type of electrons is localized and the other one is equivalent, and you have strong interactions in the system, they would lead, you know, they could lead to an excitonic uh, type um, ferroelectric. Uh, for that, you need to form an exciton condensate in that paper. Okay? There are many differences between what they had in mind and the possible manifestation here. Okay? I completely stand by the experimental data. The interpretation of whether this is an uh, electronic ferroelectric is the only one a whole bunch of my theory collaborators and I, we have been able to come up with what is consistent, but we don't have a definitive proof. In fact, it's not very easy because you know you ask around what, what is, would be the definitive proof of this. It's not like there's a protocol. It's not like a superconductor that you know what you have to do to demonstrate that it exists. There is not like a protocol. If you have an electronic or electric, you know, or an excitonic insulator, this is what you do and you know for sure that you have it. Okay. Uh, some, some of my colleagues told me, this is the protocol. <laughs> you should say, you have to see this too, but you know, okay, anyway, that's. Uh, Chris. So I'm still really hung up on the relaxation type question. Oh, sure. To put it provocatively, this exceptionally good memory could also be viewed as a really terrible LED. Real terrible LED. Because you're, you're, maybe, pumping, maybe. you're, pumping, you're, pumping, you're pumping in and making these excitons and they're just failing to recombust. Now, yeah, yeah, these, are, these are ground state excitons. They are not excited state. This is in the ground state. Okay? Yeah, excitons is later. There can't be two ground states. No, they, 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 they can be. There's something called the simulator simulator that is the ground state of the system. You know, For example, in bilayer thing, by the way, the word, Tons of theory papers because by the other thing, there's this parabolic band, but with a zero gap. Or tons of theory papers saying rather than having the balance band full in the collection but empty, you're going to promote electron core pairs in the ground state, which are going to bind, and the binding energy is more than the zero gap difference between the states, and therefore the ground state of the system, the energy, the system's going to gain energy by forming exciton rather than just occupying the kinetic energy balance band and emptying the conduction band, okay? So this a ground state of excitons is something which is, at least theoretically, I think, well established. Experimentally, much less so. What is going to happen? Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us more about your solar superconductor simulation that you have. In particular, by definition of solar superconductor breaks, uh, it breaks uh, is non-centrally symmetric. Yeah. We know that non-centrally symmetric superconductors can have some very interesting properties. Mm -hmm. So that paper, you know, the, the paper is kind of funny, you know, I, did I mention, I think I mentioned yesterday, or, or I certainly mentioned to some of you in the discussion, that this strong anomalous fall effect and the quantized anomalous fall effect in the in magic angle graphene, which happened for magic angle graphene aligned to HBM, has never been reproduced independently, by, other than those two groups. You know, one device in each of the groups. So we all think it's true because two independent groups did it, but neither themselves nor anybody else has been able to reproduce it. So there are some special conditions that apply. We tried, we thought, oh, maybe it's better if you align both sides to HVM, maybe it will be stronger magnet or something. So we made magic angle graphene with what we thought was both sides alike. Turn out these two boron like a crystals 
with different crystals, and one was at 30 degrees, but the, one, the other one was at 30 degrees. It was the configuration of this correlated thing. And then we started to switch, see this switching in this, this correlated, you know, this genetic behavior, you know, which look identical to the other one that we have seen in this binary thing. And that's how it came up with this. This was the last experiment of a student that graduated and is now at the Weizmann Institute. And we didn't, you know, we haven't been able to study it further. Okay. But indeed, a lot of people have told me if you have, you know, the thing is, you have in a way, you, we have this coexistence for electricity superconductivity, but this, this bistable switching is just switching the entire, all the correlated states, superconductivity is everything. Okay. It's not mingling with it, it's not entangling with it, you know, it's just switching the whole thing. Okay. So we're not sure yet very well how to think about it, whether it affects the actual properties of the superconducting state. Because once you're in one of the bistable states, and by the way, of course, they can be tuned continuously, but let's say, I mean, we call it bistable because it's, it's abrupt bistable, but there are many possible states, you know, depending on how far we go with displacement field and so on. We don't know if once you're in one of those states, you are modifying or the magic kind of field is just sitting quiet there, you know, if it's gonna switch. You know, we don't know if, if there's an actual effect in, of, of the superconductor being in the different states, you know, because of this inversion symmetry ratio. That, you know, we, we still have to think, this is all pretty neat. Thank you. Okay, we're going to stop there. We're going to have a photograph and then we're going to meet back in 20 minutes' time. I guess 20 minutes. Yeah, 25 minutes. 25 minutes, 25 minutes time and five minutes and five minutes to 12. Yeah, good. Yeah, we're going to do it here. We're going to come to the front. You know, the first time I saw 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 the first time I sa